Would you like to come inside and warm up? Despite living in extreme poverty, one day I extended a helping hand to a homeless mother and her daughter in the park. Although I could barely get by myself, I don't know why I did such a thing. Then, the president of the company I worked for suddenly passed away, and his younger brother, the vice president, became the new president. For some reason, I got fired and was left feeling hopeless. However, when I got home, the daughter greeted me with a sly smile, saying, Welcome back, you've worked hard. My name is Alex. I'm a 29-year-old single office worker. My friends from school called me Lex. I think it's a cool nickname, but I'm not particularly cool myself. I look pretty ordinary, or maybe below average, with glasses and black hair that give me a glooming image. I can be considerate of others, but I don't actively engage with people. Above all, I'm poor, as you can tell from my living conditions. I think my place is worse than a poor college student's. I live in a shabby apartment with rent costing only $130. The apartment technically has two rooms, but since there's no wall separating them, it's practically a one room. The bathroom and toilet are separate, but that's just because it's an old building. The kitchen is tiny, the floor is old, and the walls dividing the rooms are thin. While it's not like you can hear every sound, even slightly loud voices can be heard clearly. Privacy is virtually non-existent. Right now, I can hear a couple arguing next door. It's not just arguments, sometimes I hear their intimate moments, which makes it unbearable. Besides the noise from the neighbors, I can also hear the sounds of the illegally modified bikes and loud music from open windows outside. So, during these noisy times, I vent my work stress in my room. I don't scream or shout, but speaking bitterly to myself at a normal speaking volume helps me feel a bit better. Expressing pent-up stress verbally helps lighten my mood a bit. Some people say writing it down is helpful, but I find speaking it out loud more satisfying. It's free, and just saying it changes my mood enough. With the loud noises, my neighbors probably don't even notice, and since I'm not shouting, it doesn't bother anyone. But there's a topic that inevitably comes up at my age, it's what people call the marriageable age. Sure, I'd like to have a girlfriend. It's not something to brag about, but I've never had a girlfriend in my 29 years. Some of my classmates already have kids, but right now, I can't afford to have a girlfriend, even if I did. I don't have the financial means to support her. The reason I'm living in such poverty is because of my student loan debt, and with my salary barely increasing, I'm living paycheck to paycheck with just enough to support myself. Starting a family feels like a distant dream. Even though I'm struggling, I'm known as a diligent worker who gets the job done at the company. One day, I arrived at work to find a group of employees talking, wondering what was going on. My colleague James hurried over to me. Alex, there's been an incident. An incident, I thought. Someone might have committed embezzlement, but that wasn't it. The president passed away suddenly. What? But he was fine just yesterday. That's why it's a sudden death. The president, Mr. Bellamy, was a dapper gentleman with a distinguished look. He always walked with a straight posture, looking sharp in his suit, and seemed like a hard-working man. I'd seen him around the office several times, always looking sharp and steady on his feet, making everyone believe the company was still secure. So, who do you think will be the next president? Well, it's probably going to be him, based on the hierarchy. Kim, the person James referred to, was the president's younger brother, Robert. Occasionally, Robert came to the office, but neither I nor the other employees had a favorable impression of him. Why is he even the vice president? Because Mr. Bellamy was kind-hearted and couldn't abandon his family. But still, does he even do any work? This question left me at a loss for words. Ultimately, Robert was appointed as the new president. It made sense, they couldn't leave the presidency vacant forever. If that happened, other companies might look down on us, and some might even try to take advantage of the situation. Even so, we were filled with anxiety, knowing that Robert would now be running the company. This was because Robert had hardly been involved in the company's operations until now. I doubt he even understood how the company functioned. Normally, if you're going to become the president, you'd at least study management, even if only superficially. Our company may not be huge, 
but it still had a fair number of employees, supporting all their families requires a serious commitment. Even though he held the title of vice president, Robert didn't actually do any work. Apparently, other employees had seen him frequently engaging in gambling. These activities might be fun when you're winning, but they cause significant losses when you lose, and once you've experienced a big win, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking, next time for sure, and keep pouring money in, ending up in a downward spiral. Knowing that Robert, who had been doing such things, was the new president made us very uneasy. But there were more reasons to be worried about Robert. Oh man, I'm only feeling dread, James said. I mean, there are rumors he messed up at his previous company too. Messed up? You mean he had trouble with his boss? Exactly. This was a well-known story. Robert was known for his temper and had gotten into trouble with his boss at the company he worked for before this one, and this happened just six months after he joined. At first, I couldn't believe it. These days, people usually brace themselves to endure the first year at a new company. Quitting after just six months seemed incredibly selfish. And then Mr. Bellamy, who was kind, gave his poor brother the vice president's seat. But he probably tried to make him work too, even if he made him do vice president's work it wouldn't have been much good. Yeah, true. I hope he becomes a bit more responsible now that he's president. James's hope was unlikely to come true. People don't change that easily. Up until now, Emma from accounting had been handling most of the company matters. Emma was well known but shrouded in mystery. None of us had ever seen her or knew what she looked like. However, it was also well known that the former president had immense trust in her. She was always holed up in the accounting room, practically a legendary figure. We never saw her. I had only ever spoken to her over the phone. With Robert taking over as president, I wondered what would happen to Emma, but there was nothing I could do as just an employee. However, my worry soon became reality. Robert's policies, announced during his first addresses as the new president, left us all in shock. I'm the new president, Robert. I don't know how my brother ran things, but now that I'm in charge, there will be no more leniency. Anyone who doesn't follow my policies will be fired without mercy. It was an arrogant and high-handed speech, and the longtime employees clicked their tongues and muttered things like, stupid brother. From now on, every morning meeting will include a numerical target. Anyone who doesn't meet it will face a pay cut. Work hard and be prepared. Although I didn't say it out loud, I screamed what in my mind. Setting goals is fine, but reducing pay for not meeting them is sheer tyranny. Listen up, speed, judgment, and decisiveness are essential at work. Don't drag your feet and try to rack up overtime pay. That's easy for him to say, but there are often situations where overtime is unavoidable. That's just how the workplace is. But perhaps because he was clueless about actual work, Robert would yell at the top of his lungs if the work was even slightly delayed, making him unbelievably unreasonable. Because of this, my stress was building up every day, but I just endured it. That day, after working all day, I declined an invitation to a drink with my colleagues and headed straight to the cheap supermarket near my apartment. This supermarket always had great deals for the local poor students, but just before closing time, they added extra discount stickers. Perhaps it's the supermarket's way of ensuring they sell all their prepared foods by the end of the day, but I didn't hesitate to put several heavily discounted prepared meals into my basket. I also bought a salad marked down by 80%. Clutching the store's swinging plastic bag I used as a reusable shopping bag that was about to get holes from overuse, I headed home. On the way back, my attention was drawn to two women huddled together on a bench in a small dark park. At this late at night, if it had just been two women talking in the park, I would have ignored it, but something about them seemed off, so I stopped and stared at them. The two women looked like they were mother and daughter, judging by their similar faces. It was around 10 p.m., moreover, they were very lightly dressed for the season and looked quite dirty. I slowly entered the park and pretended to buy a warm drink from the vending machine near them, listening to their conversation. Mom, I'm cold. It's okay just snuggle up closer. Thanks, it's much better now. From that exchange, I was sure they were mother and daughter. The mother looked to be in her early 50s, and the daughter around 20. What happened to them? 
Their clothes are dirty, but they're wearing branded stuff. I recall the morning weather forecast I saw on the news. They said it wouldn't rain, but it would get quite cold tonight. These two were complete strangers to me. No one would blame me if I walked away, but my sense of justice wouldn't let me ignore them now that I had seen them. Still, I wasn't sure if it was okay to approach them. I didn't want to be mistaken for a criminal trying to take women to my place, but I couldn't just abandon them either. Oh well, here goes nothing, I made up my mind and approached the mother and daughter. Sorry, I'm not a suspicious person. I have no intention of doing anything to you. This might be a bit presumptuous, but according to the news, it's supposed to get very cold tonight. I know I'm a complete stranger, but if you don't have anywhere to go, would you like to come to my place? It's a shabby apartment, but at least you can warm up. What all I can offer is a warm bath, but I promise I won't do anything. I swear if you want, I'll even leave the room. I just don't think it's good for women to be out in the cold, so please calm down. My words were becoming incoherent, and the woman had to call me down. Right, sorry. Why did you approach us? As you can see, we're homeless with nowhere to go. Well, isn't it natural to help someone in need? What? Of course, if you think it's none of my business, I apologize. But no, it's not that. Then please come with me. I can't offer much, but at least you can give warm. I desperately invited the mother and daughter to my shabby apartment. They seemed surprised by the place they were brought to, but I offered them the back room and let them use the bath. Since I didn't have any women's clothes, I gave them an old tracksuit from my school days. I've washed it, though it might smell a bit like mothballs. It's fine, you've already done so much for us. For food, all I have is instant noodles and some prepared meals, but that's your meal, isn't it? Yes, so let's share it. While waiting for the two of them to finish their bath, I heated up the prepared meals and made two packets of instant noodles, dividing them into bowls and plates. All the dishes in my poor bachelor's home were mismatched. It was a bit embarrassing, but there was nothing I could do. I was genuinely glad I had saved someone. Used spoons and forks. I'm sorry I invited you so confidently, but this is all I can offer. No, no worries, we appreciate it. They shook their heads at my apology. Their kindness made me feel happy. After the three of us had our modest meal and finished eating, they introduced themselves. My name is Emma, and this is my daughter, Catherine. It's been a long time since we've had a warm bath and meal. I'm Alex. Alex, you're kind and full of justice, aren't you? Emma smiled as she said this. No, I'm just poor, but you helped us. Most people would just walk away, especially if they were struggling themselves, and I'm sure you had your reservations about inviting women into your home. It's true, I had many doubts. In this world, there are many people who would take advantage of kindness. However, Emma and Catherine didn't seem like those kinds of people. If you have nowhere else to go, please stay here. But it reassures me to see a light on when I come home from work. It's a shabby apartment, so I won't force you, but if it's not too much trouble, it's a small, old place, but it can at least shelter you from the weather. If I told James about this, he'd probably laugh and say I was too nice. Still, I couldn't bring myself to kick them out after just one day. You know, it's like finding a stray cat, then feeling the heartache of having to abandon it again because you can't keep it. Emma and Catherine exchanged glances, but for a moment, they looked at me and said, will accept your hospitality, and smiled. And relief washed over me. As planned, I gave them the back room and the bath towel. In the gap of the thin partition to ensure privacy, I laid out cushions in the kitchenette space and slept there. I gave the folding bed and mattress to the two women, and that night passed. The next morning, Emma left early, saying she had some errands. I couldn't say anything if she was going out to find somewhere else to stay, not wanting to be a burden on my shabby apartment. However, Emma did not return that day, nor the next, nor the day after. So effectively, it was just Catherine and me living in the apartment, and I felt a strange sense of contentment with this new arrangement. After all, I used to come back to a shabby, cold, and lonely room, but now I can return to a warm, lit room. It's needless to say that I started looking forward to coming home after work. 
Hi, Alex, I'm back. Catherine greeted me with a smile when I returned, and I smiled back. Catherine would cook delicious meals in the tiny kitchen. There weren't many ingredients in the fridge, so I pick up what seemed necessary from the usual discount supermarket on my way home, and she'd turn it into a meal. To me, it felt like magic. Having someone waiting for me when I got home became a turning point for me. Meeting Catherine made me realize the importance of people helping each other. A few days after it became normal for Catherine to be waiting for me when I got home, I was more surprised than ever when I arrived at work. What the hell is this? There was a piece of paper on my desk. No matter how many times I rubbed my eyes or washed my face, the words on it didn't change. It was a termination notice. No way. With Catherine now living with me, I needed to earn even more money, but if I got fired, we both end up homeless. Unable to accept this one-sided termination, I went straight to the president's office. I knocked twice loudly and opened the door without waiting for a response to find Robert standing deeply. Robert, it's you too. What a pain. I didn't understand his response, but I asked him about my purpose for being there. Robert, what is the meaning of this? I don't know, but isn't this termination notice from you? I slapped the termination notice on his desk, and Robert, looking annoyed, threw a few other termination notices onto his desk. You're the fifth person today. What? Yeah, four other employees have come barging in with termination notices like this. I don't remember issuing any of them. Is that true? What good would it do to lie? Robert answered irritably, and I frowned. Firing me wouldn't benefit Robert, but then who was issuing these termination notices to the employees? I had never caused any major problems, nor had I been hated or resented by anyone. Well, this is real, though. While I was still in shock, Robert picked up the termination notice with my name on it from the desk, and before I could stop him, he stamped it with his approval. Wait, please, no waiting. This is an official termination notice. Get your things and leave the company. Someone among the executives is probably calling the useless ones. With that, Robert shooed me out of the office like I was an animal. Returning to my desk, I saw that James also had a termination notice and was quite upset. However, since Robert became president, James had been considering a job change and saw this as a good opportunity, laughing about it. I envied James's optimistic personality as I packed up my desk. When I got home, Catherine greeted me as usual. Oh, hi, you're early today. Catherine welcomed me with a gentle smile, and I forced a smile as I told her everything that had happened. Actually, I got fired today. Instead of being surprised, Catherine gave a slight smile. Startled by her reaction, I followed her to the folding table she called a dining table, where she poured me a cup of hot coffee. Taking a sip of the coffee helped calm my nerves a bit. First, thank you for your hard work. No, it's... I knew I needed to start thinking about the future instead of wasting time, but Catherine began to speak first. Let me reintroduce myself. My name is Catherine Bellamy. Does that ring any bells? What? My last name is Bellamy. My father's name was Samuel Bellamy. What? Yes, my father was the former president of the company you worked for. I couldn't hide my astonishment at Catherine's words. More than anything, I couldn't understand how I hadn't realized it sooner. It's not like there are many people around with the last name Bellamy. After my father passed away, my uncle Robert kicked my mother and me out of our home. We became homeless. He took all our savings and everything else and stayed in that house. I knew he was a jerk but I didn't realize he was that bad. I'm sorry. After all, Robert was still Catherine's uncle. Calling him a jerk repeatedly wouldn't make her feel good. It's fine, he is a jerk of the highest order, king of jerks. I couldn't help but chuckle at that remarkable evaluation. The day you found us, it had been a week since we were kicked out. We were really at our wit's end. That's why my mother and I feel a debt of gratitude to you that we can't hide. That's thanks to you, Alex. We've decided to take revenge on Robert. Revenge? He might not know, but I inherited shares from my father. 
shares, and he doesn't even realize who my mother is. The fact that she wasn't fired first proves it. I didn't fully understand what Catherine was saying. What did she mean by Emma being fired? Emma, the one doing the accounting at the company, is my mother. What? No way. I couldn't help but raise my voice. Even though my parents divorced, my father had complete trust in my mother's accounting skills. They didn't work out as a couple, but they were great business partners. I remembered hearing rumors about that. Emma, who was trusted by Mr. Bellamy, was also highly regarded by the bosses. They used to say, as long as Emma is handling the accounting, the company will be fine. It's likely that Emma didn't want anyone to know she was handling the accounting for her ex-husband and thus stayed hidden in the accounting room. Also, given their divorce, she probably wanted to avoid any unnecessary complications. In the past few days, my mother has made all the arrangements. She's been laying off employees one by one to liquidate the company without Robert noticing. Now that you mention it, thinking back, there were certainly signs. Robert had said I was the fifth person to receive the termination notice that day. Judging by his attitude, he must have received termination notices from several other employees too. My mother plans to rehire everyone she laid off once the new business is set up. What? I hold the shares. Robert has no right to run the company. Catherine smiled, exuding the confidence of a leader. I had thought of her as a sweet woman but she turned out to be someone truly remarkable. A few days after this conversation, there was a commotion at the company. What? You're firing me? This is ridiculous. During a meeting held that day, the board of directors unanimously decided to dismiss Robert. Once decided by the board, it couldn't be overturned. Robert, you have two choices, work under me or find a new job yourself. So, what will it be? What? As I recall, your philosophy was about speed, judgment, and decisiveness, right? Hurry up and decide. Under Catherine's pressure, Robert declared his resignation from the company on the spot. He must have hated the idea of working under his niece, especially since he had been at the top of the company just the day before. He's a real pain, with pride in all the wrong places. However, Robert couldn't find a new job and ended up struggling. Feeling sorry for him, Catherine reluctantly decided to keep him at the company as a handyman. Catherine, you're so kind. I think I'm a fool too, but maybe I took after my father. Maybe I'll end up regretting it too. Catherine smiled, shining brightly. As for Catherine and me living together in the same room, eventually led to us becoming a couple. In short, Catherine and I are now in a relationship. I finally broke my streak of having no girlfriend my entire life. I was so happy I could have danced with joy. I considered moving to a bigger place, but Catherine said she was fine with staying in this apartment. She said she enjoyed the closeness and warmth it provided. Our life isn't exactly luxurious, but as long as we support each other, we'll find our way. I believe that, and I plan to continue living with her from now on.